there is a drawback to Newton's method. You have to calculate by hand probably the derivative and then evaluate it at each iteration. That doesn't sound like much for the little problems that we're doing, but in real applications it can actually be a major headache. Now let's recall our strategy for Newton's method. The big picture is that you compute a linear approximation to our original function near the current guess and then you find the root of that linear model. We used a tangent line in Newton's method, but that's not the only way to construct a linear approximation. And when you think about it, there's a little bit of an oddity in Newton's method that we only use the most recent point. But we have a history, at least after the first iteration. So if we were to look back even just one more iteration, then we have two points that the function passes through, and we can use the linear interpolant through those two points. So if we write the equation for a straight line, y minus a y value on the line equals x minus an x value on the line times the slope of the line. So to find the root of that model, we set y equal to 0, and that gives us our next value of x. So we do that in the formula, rearrange it, and we get a new update formula to tell us the next value, xk plus 1. This is known as the secant method. There's a very simple picture that goes with this. If we have our original function, y equals f of x, Newton's method says at the current point, use the tangent line and find the x-intercept of that. Well, when you draw a line through two points on a curve, that's what we call a secant line. And so the secant method uses the secant line instead of the tangent line. So we can perform the same kind of convergence rate analysis that we did for Newton. It's just a little bit trickier to find our error vector, or error sequence, and we subtract r in a few places and add it back in so that we don't change the thing. And the result is that we can rewrite the iteration as one on the errors instead of on the x's. As we did in Newton's method, we use Taylor expansions of all the f's here around the root x equals r. And a whole bunch of algebra later. What we find is that ek plus 1 is this constant, the same one we had in Newton's method, times ek, ek minus 1. And then a bunch of then a whole bunch of higher order stuff that we will just ignore when the errors are small. So this is very similar to what we did in Newton, but there we had ek squared instead of the product of the previous two errors. So that complicates the, the convergence just a bit, but based on the quadratic convergence we will guess that the next error is a constant times some power of the current error for an unknown power alpha. So if we put that into the error iteration, I'm just going to use beta for that constant, which we don't really care about at this point. And then we put in what ek is based on ek minus 1, again using that exponential change from one step to the next.
So when we look at both sides of this equation, the only way this could be true is if the exponents of these terms are the same. So therefore that tells us what alpha must be. It's actually the golden ratio. It's about 1.62. So what we conclude is that if the sequence converges and the errors get small, then the next error is a constant times the current error raised to this power, 1.62. That's bigger than 1, so we would say this is superlinear convergence. It's less than 2, which was Newton's method, so it's not quite quadratic either. It's somewhere in between linear and quadratic. So the tangent line, in some sense, was better. The secant line costs us a bit in the convergence department. But the most important thing is that it's super linear. Even that isn't actually the end of the story, because we are not yet doing what I would call an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. So when you look at Newton's formula, it has three things, xk, f at xk, and f prime at xk. So these two functions have to be evaluated and used just once, and then they never appear again. In the secant method, we need xk, f at xk, and f at the previous step. But since we had to compute f at the previous step already, we could just store it and remember it and bring it back in this step. So we don't actually have to do any new computation there. So if we consider evaluations of f, which is usually the most expensive part of one of these root finding algorithms in practice, it's pretty significant that Newton does two function evaluations at each iteration, and the secant method only does one. So in that sense, secant iterations could be expected to be twice as fast. The arithmetic of, of the formula doesn't really matter. It's those f evaluations that normally absorb the time in a difficult problem. So while the Newton error does square in one step, in the same amount of time or the same amount of work, we can go two steps and get alpha squared in the secant method. In other words, if we sort of normalize the iterations to equal work, if we counted Newton as two steps instead of just a single iteration, well, it would have to be the square root of two as the rate. And that's about 1.4. So when you measure work in this way, not only is secant more convenient because you don't need f prime, it's faster too. Here I define a function whose root I want to find. It has a root near 1, and I use f0 to find it as my exact value. Now I'll apply the secant function from the book to find the root. I have to supply it with two initial values. They do affect the convergence. And we can take a look at the errors, both at the numbers and at a semi-log plot. So in the plot you see not much is happening but then eventually it keeps getting steeper and steeper at each iteration. So once again, linear convergence would be a straight line. Superlinear means it keeps getting steeper than any line. But it's a little hard to tell just by looking at the plot whether it's quadratic. So we can pin it down better if we take the logs of the errors and then the ratios of those will give the exponent in the convergence. So for linear, the, these would be 1. For quadratic, they would be 2. For secant method, they're supposed to converge to about 1.62, and it gets very close to that before the iteration basically finds the root to machine precision and can't improve it anymore. Now by comparison, if we look at Newton's method, the Newton errors, when you look at the exponents, they do seem to double. The secant errors, when you look at the exponents, don't quite, because it's a slower convergence. So in this case, it took seven iterations to get down to about machine precision. Here, it took five iterations. So Newton took fewer iterations, but remember that 
how we account for work in these things, the Newton iterations are often considered twice as expensive. And so in that case, you'd actually say that the secant method would be faster on this problem. Our next idea is to carry secant one step further. In the secant method, we use the data from the two most recent values. That defines two points on the curve, the secant line, that's the linear interpolant. What if we use the three most recent values? So we'd be able to derive a quadratic interpolant through those three points. The problem with parabolas, quadratic functions, is they might have two roots, they might have zero roots. So how would you define the next value of x, especially when there is no root on the quadratic at all? So this didn't work out. We evaluated an interpolant through these three points, or more, to get a polynomial on x. And then you want to set y equals 0, which means finding the root of the polynomial, or a root of the polynomial. But since those aren't defined, or maybe not even real, that's hard to do. However, what if we just swap the role of x and y? So think of x as a function of y, and then we can get a polynomial interpolant in y. Then setting y equals to 0 just means we evaluate a polynomial. And that's easy to do and unique. The way to think about this graphically is if we had three points for f, we could draw a parabola sideways through those three points. And then where that crosses the x-axis is just one point. That's our new value for the root. This is called inverse iteration because you're interpolating values of the inverse function rather than the function itself. When you use a parabola, it's inverse quadratic interpolation. Now, I won't go through the analysis, but it can converge even faster. But you do reach a state of diminishing returns, and it's usually not taken past the second order. Now all these methods, Newton, secant, and the inverse quadratic iteration, all suffer from one big drawback, which we've pointed out since the beginning. They may not converge at all, depending on your starting point. You can get guarantees in theory. You can show that there is some neighborhood of the root that guarantees convergence. But in practice, you can almost never find where that neighborhood is. But we do have one thing left to appeal to. Going back to calculus and the intermediate value theorem, if f has a different sign at a than it does at b, then f must take the value 0 in, somewhere in the interval from a to b. Maybe more than once, but at least once. So now suppose we think c is a new root estimate somewhere in that interval. It has to agree with one of the signs at a and b, and it has to disagree with one of them. So we can pick the interval on which there is still a change of sign, either a to c or c to b. And then we know that there must be a root in that interval. This can be combined with the other ideas to give a robust algorithm. And that's what MATLAB does.